and uh, guys gather on in. We'll go ahead and get it started with a little bit of worship. And on behalf of the family, I want to thank everybody for coming out. And your presence means a lot. Amen. We'll open up with a little bit of worship. I asked Matt um, what was one of Jerry's favorite songs, and he mentioned this song. To me, it's called Heaven's Secret. I'm going to do my best with it, but I think it's so fitting for the moment. This aching heart won't last forever. I know that all things work together as if you. Sing to all my sorrow. You turn it into joy. The wind carries your whisper, and I can hear you still small. aching heart won't last forever I know that all things work together once your love was in enough you promised us all of heaven's secrets I know that we will see As if, as if your love wasn't enough, you promised us all of heaven's secrets. I know that we will see it. I can feel peace coming, and I can see. It's my feet. Both of you know it's saying. I can feel peace coming. And I can see fear running. You love it just does something. It's my feet to dance in. 
No. There's nothing you keep from us. Hallelujah. All we have to do is trust. There's nothing you keep from us. Trust you, God. All things work together, yeah. All things work together, yeah. All things work together. All things work together for our good, for our good. All things work together. As if, as if your love was in enough, you promised us all of heaven's secrets. I know that we will see it. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of it all. And you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You 
Yes, you are. Yeah, you're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. And you deserve the glory. Yeah. And you deserve. single praise every single praise all my days belong to you they belong to you they belong to you every day every care every fear Every doubt, Lord, we cast, we receive your goodness, we receive your kindness, we receive your mercy, yeah. Receive your grace. <laughs> Amazing grace. We receive your amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your presence, your power, and your person. You mean so much to us. And we give you the glory for the life and the legacy of the Apostle John Wesley. Thank you for this man, this husband, father. for him or the day that he passed away but he's been elevated in our hearts and our minds all these years and we thank you for the life of Christ that was so evident in him we appreciate you Lord for giving us this man of God and giving the body of Christ this man of God we are so much further along in this journey of life because of Apostle Jerry Wesley. And Father, we just give you the praise today for the Hester family and the legacy that doesn't die today but continues to live on and on and on. 
and on generation after generation and nation after nation. And we give you praise for that today. In the precious name of Jesus, let the church say amen. You will be seated. I'm not here to preach, I know. That's hard for a preacher. But I preached my voice out last night, so I was supposed to be teaching, but you hear what happened. That's what happens when you get in a good anointed atmosphere. But I, I, I love the Hester family with all of my heart and all of my life. Melanie, bless you. Brother Little John, bless you, sir. Uh, Matt, your family, Megan, y'all mean so much to Lynette and I. And we're so thankful for you guys. Uh, I, I thought about a couple of verses of scripture, and I know that would be appropriate. Let me give that. Uh, the first one I thought about was Psalm 46 and 4. And Psalm 46 and 4, if you don't know that scripture, you'll remember the words of that scripture. There is a stream whereof, the, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of our God. Of course, we know that city is the church. It's ultimately the kingdom of God. And if Apostle Jerry Hester preached anything and believed anything, it was that the kingdom of God was a present reality in the earth today. He preached the kingdom is at hand. And um, I'm so thankful for that because he was a kingdom man. And he was really, uh, if I can say this without being offensive, an unknown in many circles. And even though he was unknown, he was behind some of the most known in the kingdom circles. I know uh, Jonathan's coming in a little bit. I know how much he helped Brother Varner in putting together so many themes of the kingdom of God in writing. But more than that, the realities of who your father, your husband was, is seen right here in this room today in the children and the grandchildren, and believe it or not, soon to come, the great-grands and the great-great-grands, even up to a thousand generations. And we thank the Lord for that. But this scripture reminds me of your dad. It reminds me of your husband. There, the, There's a river. The streams make glad. I'm thankful because I grew up uh, a kingdom before kingdom was cool. And But my dad never was locked in to just one camp. The Assemblies of God didn't like my daddy because he stretched his wings outside of their Pentecostal denomination. The Sonship Brothers didn't like my daddy because he stretched his wings outside into the charismatic arena. The Charismatics and the Word of Faith didn't like him because he stretched his wings further than they could fly into this gospel of the kingdom. And even some of them didn't like him because he was too Pentecostal for them. That's where I get this voice from. But this is why I like Apostle Hester. Because he was a man like the streams that make glad the river of God. When you come to him, you just didn't get one facet of God. You got the many faceted face of who Jesus really is. You saw the apostolic and the prophetic as well as the present truth in the kingdom of God. And there's so many churches today that have an apostolic prophetic flavor, but they don't teach the kingdom. Or they teach the kingdom and they no longer have a prophetic edge on them. But this man of God and this family are pioneers and stalwarts of the prophetic message in the kingdom of God. And I just wanted to come today and couldn't miss it, even with my voice going out. Didn't want to miss it. If I had to whisper, I would tell you I love you. And I love you because of him. And I love you because he's not dead. I looked on YouTube on the way here, driving from Myrtle Beach. I, I said, I, I want to see if there's something on YouTube of, of Dead Hester. I found one video. One, just one. Can you believe that? 
and it was him sitting at a desk five years ago greeting uh, All Nations, United Nations Church on their fifth anniversary or something like that. And it was such a fatherly man sitting there talking to me. And I just appreciate that so much. And just hearing his voice this morning on the way here blessed my heart. And so I just want to say his voice is still speaking. And I'm so glad to be a part of that voice today. I bless you on behalf of Lynette and our family, the Dutton family, and we love you and bless you, Hester's and, and then the little John family. We love y'all. Appreciate you. God bless you. Good morning. It's indeed an honor to be able to stand here and to share about Apostle Jerry Hester. Back in 1993, I walked through the doors of Greenville Community Church located down in Taylor, South Carolina. At that time, I was shy, I was timid, Yes, but I had a heart for the things of God, and I was seeking a spiritual father. On that very day, I met Apostle Jerry Hester, and I was blessed with the relationship that has transformed my life and that has shaped me into the person that I am today. Apostle Jerry, he was my apostle, he was my pastor, he was my mentor, he was my spiritual father, but more than anything, he was my friend. Throughout the years, the 28 years that I've known Apostle Jerry, I've gleaned a lot, I've learned a lot, I developed a lot, I changed a lot. And what I'd like to do today is just to share five things about what I learned through Apostle Jerry and about who he was. Apostle Jerry was a fearless pioneer of present truth. He gave his whole life equipping the people of God to know what the Holy Spirit is presently saying to the church. He taught us that we are to rule, to reign, to subdue, and to have dominion. He taught us to pursue and to perceive the present truths that the Lord is revealing to us and how he is restoring his church. He also taught us to read, to study, and to think. I'm going to tell you, Apostle Jerry was a strong advocate of the prophetic ministry. And he taught us the importance of hearing the voice of God first for ourselves and then for others. He understood that all of us can prophesy, that all of us can hear the voice of God. Y'all remember we would have the prophetic conferences training the body of Christ to prophesy. We learned that all of us was going to prophesy, all of us can prophesy, whether you want to or not, all of us can hear the voice of the Lord. And then don't forget about Friday nights. Those were our outreach nights. People would come from all over, hungry, ready to receive prophetic ministry. And what would we do? We would prophesy and prophesy and we would prophesy. And you know, in doing any service, you may be asked to be on a prophetic team. You're shaking in your boots, butterflies in your stomach. You're sweating, but we allowed ourselves to be stretched and we prophesied the word of the Lord. I can remember times when the mic was given to me 
and the command was given, prophesy. And I would say, uh, what, what you, what, 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 Apostle Jerry, what you want me to say? And he would say, open your mouth and he'll fill it. <laughs> and every time I opened my mouth and truly the Holy Spirit would fill it. And then there were times that they would be getting together a prophetic team and you'd be waiting for your name to be called. And then if your name wasn't called, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> then music, you all know that Apostle Jerry loved music. He would spend hours pulling together the praise music sets. He would dig deep in uh, theme, kingdom songs, but he wanted to make sure that it were anointed and full of present truth. It didn't care. He didn't matter the genre. On Sunday mornings, you would come in. You could hear country. You could hear hip-hop. You could hear, it didn't matter, classical, but you knew that they were kingdom and they were powerful songs. Remember, the presence of the Lord is here. Yeah. <laughs> Remember all those Ron Cannoli songs we would do? <laughs> then Apostle Jerry was intent on us entering into the presence of God. He wanted the Lord to be satisfied with our worship. He wanted the Lord to be satisfied with our praise. And he didn't care what it took. All of us were going to move from the outer court to the inner court to the holy of holies. Everybody was going to go beyond the veil. And if it meant that we were going to play that song again <laughs> and again and again, everybody was going beyond the veil. And I'm like, come on, y'all, press in, press in. We've already missed lunch. You want to miss dinner, too? <laughs> Apostle Jerry taught us that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he would do his hand like this. The kingdom of God is here. You don't have to die to experience heaven, that heaven is right here. He would say that there is a thin veil between the natural and the supernatural. And even though Apostle Jerry has transitioned, he still lives. He still has a major role in the kingdom of God. He would tell us that when you go to heaven, you're not going to be sitting on charming clouds, playing a harp, and eating grapes. He would say that whatever you don't learn about the kingdom on this side, you will learn about it on the other side. And if you refuse to take the Bible courses on this side, you're going to take them when you get to heaven. As a matter of fact, once you enter into those pearly gates, you're going to be greeted by Apostle Jerry sitting at a six-foot table with freshly printed out Kelly Varner workbooks, and one of them's going to have your name on it. So get your highlighter. Get your pen, get your Bible, and get to work. That was Apostle Jerry. That's who he was, and I am persuaded that that's who he still is. We love you, Apostle Jerry, and we thank you for pouring out your life for others. Amen.
Thank you, Ann, for those wonderful memories of Apostle. And that's what I'm just going to talk about for a minute today. And You'll have to forgive me sometimes when I talk about those that I truly love. My dad used to say I had two little ducks, and they like to go swimming. Hello, everyone. For those of you who may not know, I'm Jonathan Varner, standing today on behalf of the Varner family. Our families have always had a very special friendship, and for that, I'm very thankful. Thank you, guys, for sharing Apostle Jerry with us. Thank you. I know sometimes when you wanted to spend time, he was with some of us. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. I don't know if Eli's still in here, but when I walked in today and saw that picture, I said, oh my gosh. I could not believe it, and I had never seen that picture. I was sitting with some friends last night at a gathering, and one looked at me and said, tell me a Jerry Hester story. And I have to tell you that so many of them flashed in my memory. I, I almost broke down weeping. So I redirected the conversation. I was trying my best not to cry, but they wouldn't give in. After a while, they came back and said, Hey, man, I asked you to tell me a Jerry Hester story. And this was my reply. One of my favorite things about Jerry Hester was watching the look on his face, seeing his natural and his spiritual kids worship. You could see him beaming from across the room knowing his kids were doing what they were created to do, worship their father. His passion for worship was evident to all that knew him and was expressed in a powerful way through Dominion Church. It has been fitting to me that in this service, you've already, already done what he loved to do, and that was worship. Another thing, and this is what I want to talk about for a minute, guys, that came to my mind is we all need a friend like Jerry Hester. I want to say that again. We all need a friend like Jerry Hester. Jerry Hester and Kelly Varner were dear friends. We all need friends who encourage us in our work. And not only that, they're willing to jump in and help us make it better. Apostle Jerry wrote many of the workbooks that accompanied my father's books. He did this so people could grasp the main points my dad was trying to make and make them more easily understood. Another thing that Jerry did for dad was celebrate him. I can remember two or three times where he rented out a room and would just have people come and love on him. And you know, in ministry, especially if somebody carries a a real strong anointing or they have a strong personality a lot of times we don't know how few friends they have and I just want to tell you guys thank you so much because when we would on the drive home you know my dad would just sit there and weep and know how much he was loved here Apostle Jerry Hester, your love for worship and the word has passed the generational test. 
and is continuing on throughout your family. May we take that special part of you that we observed and pass it on to all of those that we encounter in our daily lives. Guys, be that friend. Be that friend that Jerry Hester was to Kelly Varner. Find something that your friend loves. Jump in there. Help them make it better. Love you guys. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't think you heard what I just said. Let me say that again. Uh, don't get it twisted. Can we give God a real hand clap of praise, like for real, for real, like yeah. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm going to, uh, I told my mom, I told Apostle Deborah I was going to go first. I don't know how long it is that I can last. Um, and so, first and foremost, uh, our condolences from, of course, the Child's family and the entire Life family to the Little John family. Um, Mama Hester, as I call her, I love you. Uh, my big brother, my big sister, I love you guys. Um, just thinking about a couple things. Uh, on the way up here about Apostle Jerry Hester, um, the, the scripture that came to mind was uh, Luke 22 and 10, and it, it was when uh, they were preparing for the Last Supper, and Jesus sent those disciples, and they said, how will we know where to go? Uh, and he said, it'll be a man carrying a bucket of water. Follow him. Uh, when I think about Apostle Jerry Hester, I always think about the man that's carrying that bucket of water because whenever I was thirsty, I knew where to go. Like I will oftentimes uh, kid people like, I know we're going to Dominion. When I leave, I'm going to leave with about 25 messages. Uh, listen, as a young preacher, I'm going to tell you this. I'm a known plagiarist. Uh, I have preached so much of his stuff. Listen, the first time I gave him credit, the second time I said a man said, the third time it was all mine. Like that's what I have done uh, with his messages. And so... Uh, I came here today to simply say uh, thank you, Apostle Jerry Hester. Um, he, though we didn't talk much, man, uh, like the words that he spoke over my life, like at every moment in my life, it's been a prophetic word that he spoke into existence. I'm talking about at key moments of my life, he has always been there. You guys have always been there, not just him, but you guys have always been there. And so I wanted to come today and simply say uh, thank you for those words that I still hear now. It's, it's like uh, every other week is something that I may hear that he has said. I remember one thing Apostle Deborah that he used to always tell us. He used to say, Joshua, don't count the number of the people. He used to always say, weigh the people. You have to carry a weight, son, and I remember and I take things like that uh, with me on a daily basis. And the biggest thing, he was a man that was big in stature, uh, but of course his heart was bigger than that. Uh, Mama Hester, the biggest thing um, that I'm appreciative for is that um, he loved us through it all. It was a, it was a time where I experienced the worst moment of my life uh, my senior year in high school. And uh, while other folk, church, church folk, were turning their backs on us, like they embraced us. They you guys took care of us. You loved us. And you restored my dad. And so I just wanted to thank you uh, for all of that. Uh, I think that's about all I got, man, before I going to another place so uh before i do anything um and i know my mom is going to say some words uh, i believe um that this is appropriate um i love him i know you love him um i know he's celebrating with my father right now in heaven amen but can we do this can we stand to our feet and give apostle jerry a, just a standing ovation can we do that can we just celebrate him 
Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're so honored to be here. Amen. And to stand in this place is such an honor. Uh, Pastor Josh had asked me, Mama, where did you meet? Um, when did you meet Apostle Hester? But I, I actually, I didn't, and his wife, actually what happened, how we came involved because they've been out covering for years. And uh, I saw them because I was in Addyville, South Carolina, and of course, during the 80s and 90s, it was that not that popular. We've already established, and we already know that this man of God and this church were truly tr trailblazers, pioneers, a man of the apostolic and the prophetic. He was truly a an, ap an, an apostle of the faith. Amen. And uh, so I'm so honored because I saw them on TV with Bill Hammond. And I saw this little tiny lady with this big man. <laughs> and they were talking with Bill Hammond. And I was like, oh, my God, they're in Greer. Somebody's close to me that knows about the prophetic. Amen. And so that's how I came. And I did come, sis, on those Friday nights. Amen. Where we would praise the Lord for two and three hours. <laughs> And uh, so that's how we met because I was searching. God put them there for me, I truly believe, because in a small town, Abbeville, South Carolina, amen, black woman, amen, trying to pioneer, amen. Come on, the apostolic and prophetic in a confederate city, are y'all crazy? <laughs> you know, and so, amen, but I found that God had them there, and I'm so grateful to this day because they poured into us, amen. And like Pastor Josh said, when everybody turned their backs, uh, Prophet Martha, they took me, honey, and they took me, and she prayed over me, and she declared and prophesied and took me through deliverance, amen, those things, amen, that we tend to forget, but those were the things that kept us going, and I'm so grateful, prophetess, for amen, you putting those things and being there for me. I remember, I, I, I heard his voice, I hear your voice so often, and you would tell me, you're not going down, you're not going down, and I want you guys to know that you're not going down, because when that mantle went up, <laughs> come on, it fell down, Matthew, amen, hallelujah, you better understand, amen, that that mantle went up to fall down, amen, upon y'all, and you're going to walk a greater walk, and so I'm so grateful that I've heard you guys already realize, because he was a kingdom man, he was truly, he truly advanced the kingdom, and so, you know, the Lord just told me to tell you, when you talk about him, amen, recognize now that he's living in the kingdom, what he always preached about is manifested to him now. Amen. And when you talk about him, talk about him from present tense. Amen. Glory to God. Because he taught present truth, as you said, woman of God. And so I know there are times when, you know, my husband went on to be with the Lord in January. And there are times when we get to talking about him and I forget. And sometimes I call. I said, Gene. And then I said, oh, but I forgot you with, you, you with, you with the father. And so sometimes you're going to forget, but I want you to just, rip when you say that and, it, and, it, and all, sometimes the tears will come back and whatever, you just have to remember, but oh, you're living in the kingdom. I tell the kids, uh, Apostle Matthew, I tell them and they'll say, we miss Paul Paul. And I say, but you know he's with Jesus. You know he's living in heaven now. That's where he is. And so because he is alive, we give God the glory. We give him the praise. And I pray that you guys, those things will hold you, that you will remember he is alive. And you will remember that he is with the Father when you tend to forget, amen. And you will remember that even through all your grieving, and we do that, but that's because you love him so, amen. That's just our, our love in pain right now, amen. But God, he, he's going to soothe it all, amen, because he's your comforter. And just remember, amen, that he is with the Lord. Just remember, amen. I, I remember when David, God gave me this for my husband been passed. Uh, David, uh, when, when his son passed, the word of the Lord says, and I never saw that in scripture, how he got up and he went and worshiped the Lord. And he went and worshiped the Lord. And he said, I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. And so I leave you with those words of comfort. Daddy's, he's well and alive. 
He's well, and he is just waiting on you guys. Amen. So carry that mantle on well, man of God. Carry it on well, woman of God. We love you so much. Hello. It's good to see everybody's face today. Old friends, newer friends, people who I've known for years. Um, you know, I came here in, back in 1995 as a, as a Clemson University student looking for God, looking for God. And, you know, I remember this. I was thinking about this this week and last week about, you know, what was I doing at that time in my life? And I remember sitting in my dormitory, the shoeboxes, as they call them over there in Clemson, and I was reading the book by T.D. Jakes called Loose That Man. And one of the scripture, one of the verses in that, in that book, or one of the things he said in that book was, you know, every man needs to have a spiritual father. And when I read that, the presence of God fell on me, and I cried out to God. Lord, send me a spiritual father. And so I was in my room crying. Lord, send me a spiritual father. And then like Pastor Deborah, I was looking at TV one day with some friends, and we saw on TV this little lady <laughs> and this big guy talking about the prophetic and the apostolic. And so my friends and I, we decided, man, we going there. You know, we were in Clemson. We getting there. We didn't know how to get there, but we're going to get there. You know, and so we got in a car, came on up the grill. No, actually, it was Taylor's. It was in Taylor's, coming up the Taylor's. And we came into the room, and it was Friday night. And uh, uh, Irvin, Rick Irwin, not Rick, what's, what's the guy? Jim, Jim Irwin from, from uh, uh, Christian International was there. And, man, the house was full of people praying, worshiping the Lord, prophesying. Then all, then all of a sudden, the power went out. Yeah. <laughs> Paul went out. And guess what? That man kept on prophesying. <laughs> and Apostle Jerry was there, said, get it. You know, he was like directing people, you know, telling people, hey, go help this person. Go help, this, you know, making sure everybody was doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, I'm, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking, all right, all right, I like this. Okay, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. And so we left. And for several weeks, didn't know where I was going to go. I kept asking God, where am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to be? And he, at the time, we were at Greenville Community Church. And I, kept, I heard the Holy Spirit always saying to me, GCC. He kept just, just those letters, GCC. And so I got up, and I had determined I was going to get there again. And I finally got there, and I walked into the building, a small little building. And some of y'all have heard this story before. I walked into the building, and they were doing something. For, you know, this, this, I raised Baptist, you know, so I, you know. And I hadn't seen some of the things I was about to walk into the door <laughs> seeing. So I walked into the room, and I'm probably some of y'all have never seen this. <laughs> and they were doing something called chair diving. <laughs> and so I walked in, I said, okay. <laughs> and so they were running across the chairs and they were diving into the presence of the Lord. And they had people cross hand like this right here, catching them and throwing them up in the air. And I said, all right. Mm -hmm. They said, come on, brother. I said, no, that's okay. I said, I'm going to walk on over here. They said, no, 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 come on, come on. And Apostle Jerry was up at the front kind of directing everything, making somebody bust their head on the floor and all that good stuff. And, and so I said, all right. So I got on the chairs, and I went running across, and I dove. And the moment I dove in the air, God said, this is where you're supposed to be. And I've been here ever since. And when I came, I received a father and a spiritual mother. And God, who you see now is the man that God made me be through the training, the teaching, the loving of this wonderful man and woman of God. I've been training the prophetic out of the wazoo. <laughs> training the kingdom out of the wazoo. Every teaching that he did with with, uh, with the Varna booklets and things of that nature, I went through. And we learned how to read, study, and think. 
and we blew Apostle Barnum's mind when, we, when he came one night and, we, and he was about to say it and we said it before he said it. You know, blew his mind. But that's because of Apostle Jerry. That's because he was diligent in how he trained us. He was diligent in making sure we understood God. He was diligent in making sure we heard God for ourselves before we went and tried to do something. And if we ran off anywhere and did something and we came back with our, with our tail between our legs, he said, what did God say? What did God say? And before you went to go do it, he'll ask you, what did God say? He was always redirecting you, not to him, but to the Lord. And that's one thing I learned. You know, he wasn't the person you needed to be focused on. Right. Right. It was the father. One other thing I, I learned how to do when I, when I came. It's dance. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't do that yeah. before I came. Now I did a little bit of dancing in the club, but I didn't. I didn't. I, but I wasn't dancing in church. And so I went one day to a, a, a session where Melody was teaching the kids, and and, and I was sitting out in the, in, the, in the, just sitting, you know, watching them. And the presence of, and the kids were just being kids. They weren't doing anything special. They were just being who they are. And Melody was leading them up, and the presence of God fell on me. I said, Okay. I think I'm going to embrace this and do it. I didn't know how much I was going to embrace it, though. <laughs> and that's the truth. And so y'all see these stairs, these steps right here, right? And so in our, one of our previous buildings, you know, Pastor Jerry used to come up there and be in the pra on, on the praise team. So he was, he was always leading. He'll, he'll be up there with the mic, and we'll be up there, me, Carmen, and a bunch of other folk be up there praising the Lord. And then uh, he, got the, he got the bright idea one day when there was people still right, kind of right here. And I was still learning how to, you know, kind of worship the Lord through dance. I'm, he's standing right here, and I'm standing right beside him. He decides to put his hand on my back and push me. Yeah. <laughs> Which is telling me, you need to go dance. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any whole, a whole lot of room to do what he was telling me to do. So I was forced to dance on these steps. I'm thinking, Pastor Jerry, what are you doing? So I'm dancing on the steps, and I'm learning how to dance on steps and doing a pretty good job without falling and breaking my neck. But he would always push you past your limits, push you past what you thought you could do. And he always said, sense God's presence. Always know his presence. He brought people in. He brought in the volunteers. He brought in different people always to try to teach us. He didn't, he didn't limit it just to himself. He brought in people to teach us about the kingdom, to teach us about discerning of the Holy Spirit, teaching us about prayer counseling, teaching us about all the different things that we needed to know about the kingdom of God. He equipped the people so that they can go out and do the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4.11. He believed that. He lived that. And he was all about doing that. And so we who are here, those who are here, who have come and gone, they all experienced it. Yeah. Every last one of you who came under, the, under this house experienced training and equipping. And you were able to do what you do because of it. Yeah. You're better because of it. I'm better because of it. And so I just want to say, Pastor Jerry, thank you. I know you hear me. I told you before you pass into the next dimension, thank you, but I'm telling you again, thank you. And I appreciate you, Prophet Martha, because all you do is love on people. And nobody's perfect, but your heart is always to love people. And so I appreciate all that you do. And I appreciate your heart of discernment to discern what's real. Always real. Always real. And so, guys, I just want to, I just want to do one thing. Can we just sense the presence of God now? And let's just stand up and just raise a, a, a shout of hallelujah, as Pastor Jerry used to do. He was, he would get up and he would say, "Will you just tell God hallelujah?" Can we just give a, ho a hallelujah shout like he would do right now? Yeah. Can we do that? One, two, three, hallelujah! hallelujah. Woo! Come on now, yeah! Hallelujah. During the praise and worship, I felt like
Council Jerry would not approve of this. All of us just kind of standing around singing a song. He'd want Tim dancing and flags and billows. And so I apologize if we didn't honor you in that way. <laughs> um, but the first thing my mom asked was, is Tim going to dance <laughs> when she got here? And Apostle Jerry would say, I taught them everything they know. <laughs> he would say that. Um, so with all the preparations, there are a few things that might fall through the crack. So I want to apologize, Ruth, if you're watching. Your poem is at my house <laughs> on my desk, so I do apologize. We will post that on our Dominion page. Um, but instead of that, I want to read Martha's thoughts to Jared. Dear love, I want to thank you so much for the last 43 years. I am so thankful for your unconditional love. I want you to know that helped me so much. I am thankful that you showed me how to forgive on credit. You showed me about generosity, kindness, and trust. You refused to let me stay fearful and always encouraged me that I should spread my wings and fly. And he's still encouraging me to do that. You always put me first, even if you did without. Most of all, I am so thankful for you being Jesus to me. You showed me how to trust him no matter what was happening and to hear his voice for myself. Today, I honor my best friend, my husband, an incredible dad, and papa. Now you are in his presence face to face. I pray that I make you proud. I will not say goodbye. I will see you later. Love, Martha. All right, Melody, your turn. <laughs> I know Megan's name's um, on the program, but a couple of days ago, I just felt like I should give this a go. So I'm going to try to just stick to what I read. So, okay. My earliest memory of our dad is in our family home in Traveler's Rest. We are in the living room of our four-room mill house, and I'm standing on his feet, holding his hands, and we are dancing around the room to music. I'm guessing I was maybe four or five at the time, possibly a little younger. Little did I know that those hands and feet would carry me through to where I am now. He taught us early on to love music, to love people, to love God, and to love life. I've watched my parents give everything for what they believed in. They both worked full-time jobs, raising three kids, and decided starting a ministry was a good idea. <laughs> they would not be held back from what they believed God had told them. It's been a crazy ride. Some of you have been here all the way, most of the way, or some of the way. Their crazy zeal for God has all of you guys sitting here today. My dad wanted you me and those to come to know that God loves you and that he is for you. Six months or so ago, he would ask almost every other day, it seemed, for two certain people. He would always ask constantly, have you talked to them? Where are they? When can I see them? After he came home, within that two-week time span, he was able to meet and see those two people. In his own words, he needed to make amends with them. But in making that amends, he mostly shared with them how God loved them right where they were at. And they had not done anything so bad to keep God away from them. After he met with them and shared his heart with them, he seemed to be at rest, to be at peace, and was ready to start his journey home. We have um, always said that dad's heart is bigger than his body. Over the years, I've been alongside my parents as they worked hard and gave hard. I have memories loaded with buying groceries for families, buying entire Christmas lists for kids, seeing people's bills paid, 
people bailed out of jail, people being picked up from rehabs, and countless people living with our family throughout the years. One of the most memorable times is when my parents felt we had ample room in our three-bedroom home to invite a family of a mom and her eight children to live with us for six months. Yeah, okay. It was a mad party every day to a little kid. Looking back as an adult, I would have lost what is left of my mind, okay? But Dad always said that as Christ, we should find a need and fill it, and my parents took that literally. Dad gushed forgiveness, sometimes to his own detriment. I would know things that people had done to them, said about them, whether it was my business or not, I would know. And my dad would open up his arms and lovingly embrace that person as if it was the first time he had ever met them. I would be in total disbelief, only to be told by my dad that they had already been forgiven by the Lord and any offense to the, him that he had already forgiven them on credit. I would be bewildered, roll my eyes, and be thinking, what the, you know. These are life lessons that I'm still trying to walk out to forgive on credit. Now, don't get me wrong, my dad had his share of faults, his feet of clay, but don't we all? Through life, I've seen my dad make mistakes, fail, make wrong choices, but he was always quick to ask for forgiveness and do his best to right a wrong. He wasn't afraid to admit, to admit he was wrong, to take responsibility. Again, another life lesson. My dad and I have always been as thick as thieves. From late night TV show marathons to oogling over the cutest animals, obsessing over Christmas, and to just baking things so we could taste it. If there was a good time to be had, he was always close by. Growing up, he was notorious for hiding and scaring us. My mom, my friends, pretty much anyone. He had a great sense of humor, funny all the time. Although, I still cannot figure out wh why he did not find my Will Ferrell memes as funny as I do. I have no idea. He, he hated Will Ferrell, just so you guys know. Some of you may not know, but my dad majored in opera and minored in piano in college. He was very talented musically. He went on tour in Europe with a singing group. He's pretty fancy. Um, he always had a variety of music playing when we were growing up and we learned to appreciate just about every genre of music. There was a time when we could spout off composers within a few seconds of hearing one of their scores. Now I can't do that today so don't try to ask me that. Okay. Um, they took us to operas and plays as children and um, I have memories of being at Brevard Music Center in North Carolina listening to operas, not understanding a word, but being completely captivated. I guess that is where my love for the performing arts started. So dad, thank you for that. So I guess it just scratches the surface of who my dad was. The last day he was with us, he talked almost the entire time. We were pretty much think he was trying to give us a list of things to do or a project to work on. He loved lists. He made lists for everything. He would only get upset when Matt would lose the list because Matt would have never even written down the list to begin with. He always had a ministry project in the works. The past several months, every time he saw Lainey and I, he would ask me if we were going to get to work on the project, how far we were on the project, and if the project was finished. He never told me what the project was. So, um, so Dad, I guess you're working on the project on your side, and I'll work on the project on this side. So I'm going to take a wild guess that the project is navigating life without you. So, Dad, I will keep walking toward the light and try to find my way back. We will try to help Mom learn how to eat three meals a day <laughs> and to learn to laugh again. We will keep your dogs spoiled and slip them bacon every once in a while, and I will let them know that it's from you. We won't let your art, fits, and hibble collections get hawked at a yard sale. Even though we threatened you with that through the years after cleaning them for the thousandth time, I'll make sure your grandkids remember that they are chosen for greatness and that it's okay to sit down and be quiet sometimes. He was notorious for telling them to sit down and be quiet. 
So, Dad, this is what I want you to know. You have been one of my greatest treasures. It's been an honor to journey with you, to be your daughter, and to be your friend. And I love you with my whole heart. I am so thankful that BD has agreed to read these thoughts from my heart. I'm BD, by the way, <laughs> Matthew's brother-in-law. And yes, these words are written on this sheet of paper, actually eight, for me to say. I, Matthew, would share these words myself, but I lack the extraordinary ability to cry and speak at the same time. I'm convinced that the ability to simultaneously cry and speak is one of the forgotten gifts of the Spirit. So few people possess this elusive gift that no one ever talks about it anymore. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everyone who has sent their love, support, and encouragement to our family as we mourn the loss of Dad. Dad always had a heart for the nations, but wasn't able to go himself. I find it fitting that over the last few weeks, the nations have come to him. I have received numerous calls, text, and direct messages from across the globe from people sending their prayers, condolences, and support. Knowing that we have so many who are praying and standing with us during this time has given our family supernatural strength. My dad didn't really care for funerals. He told me on more than one occasion that there were essentially three kinds of people that would attend your funeral. First, the people who came to grieve and celebrate the life of someone they loved. Second, the people who came to mourn the life and the opportunities they missed. Third, the people who came to make sure that the rumors of your passing are true. <laughs> he would then say, make sure that no one is disappointed. I was asked recently by someone who never had the privilege of meeting dad what he was like. I was surprised by how quickly my answer came. My dad was the kind of man who would give his life for what he loved, was generous to a fault, and had no problem causing some trouble. <laughs> my dad would give his life for what he loved. My dad loved God and family and spent his life proving it. He devoted more than 40 years of his life in ordained ministry, and most of that time he spent pastoring. Dad loved God, and nothing would excite him more than to see someone's heart touched by the voice and comfort of their Heavenly Father. He also understood the significant tension between ministry and people. He often said ministry would be so much easier if it didn't involve people. <laughs> but since ministry is people, you can't have one without the other. I watched him love people through moments that broke his heart and caused him seek sleepless nights. I also watched him love people straight into their destiny and purpose. Through the highs and the lows of a life devoted to equipping others, Dad knew how to, deep, how to keep his love on. Dad loved family. Yes, he showed us the feel-good, emotional kind of love, but he also demonstrated the in-the-trenches, confrontational, saving kind of love, too. He loved us enough to not only allow us to pursue our own self-destructive tendencies, to, oh, he, he loved us enough to not allow us to pursue our own destructive, self-destructive tendencies. He taught us, and many sitting in this room, 
how to understand and apply the love explained in 1 Corinthians 13 and make it real in our lives. Anywhere you see the word love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, put your name in its place. This is how it would go. Matthew is patient. Matthew is kind. Matthew does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Matthew does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Matthew does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Matthew always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Dad, thank you for being an example to us of this kind of love. My dad was generous to a fault. Anyone who knew my dad well knew that he was a generous person. He was generous with his time, money, gifts, and abilities. I can recall many times growing up when he would buy trunkfuls of groceries for families who had no food. Carts full of toys that would mean Christmas for a family who otherwise wouldn't have one. Giving people money to break the vicious cycle of payday loans and buying more meals for people than I could count. My dad was a giver. If he found out that you liked something, Get ready to get it. <laughs> and then some. When my dad found out Megan liked elephants, she basically had to beg him to stop buying her elephant stuff. <laughs> when dad found out that Ann Fial liked Fitz and Floyd, well, her house is now full of it. Just about anyone who was close to dad ended up with at least a couple of pieces of art from Edna Hibble, his all-time favorite artist. My dad's love language was the gift, giving of gifts, no doubt about it. Dad was generous with his time. Over the course of 40 years of ministry, he literally spent thousands of hours teaching and equipping others. He also spent as much time privately counseling and walking others through their own personal challenges and hardships. He never thought of anyone as too far gone and would gladly give his time over and over again if it meant that someone might be helped as a result. Despite doing all of this, he still made us feel like we, his family, came first. It's a tricky thing to share your parents with others, but dad had the grace to spread himself around. I'm still not quite sure how he did that. My dad had no problem causing some trouble. <laughs> My dad had a mischievous side. Yes, he would start food fights in the middle of a Quincy's <laughs> or blame me for saying something he actually said or blame me for making a decision that turned out to be less than favorable. <laughs> but he always knew how to be mischievous to speak to a greater purpose. When he was convicted that something was true, no matter how much it went against the established norm, he knew how to expose people to new ways of thinking. And as you can imagine, this would oftentimes stir up some trouble. Sometimes there just isn't a way to lead someone into something new without causing some discomfort. My dad also knew how to use humor to get people to take their medicine. He did this in public gatherings and private counseling sessions. I'm sure that it was this quality in particular that made him so easy to trust. Yes, he was wise, and you knew he cared deeply about you, but you also knew that he wasn't going to let you stay where you were. He loved you enough to push you, to challenge you, to cause some trouble to shake you from your apathy. Dad knew that causing a bit of trouble wouldn't necessarily help him garner a large following or build a mega church, but he knew that it would help him forge lifelong, authentic relationships. 
as he would say, be real and you'll always attract real people. He was a pioneer, no doubt, but what's, so, but what's so romantic about that? Yes, it's the pioneers who discover new paths, study new truths, and bask in the morning sun while others are still sleeping. But it's also the pioneers who post the do not drink the water, and there's a cliff ahead signs. The signs are there because being a pioneer doesn't spare you hardship. My dad never seemed to despise simply putting in the work so that he could learn, not necessarily so he could win. I pray that I learned this lesson well. How do I close this out? There are so many stories I wanna share, but there is not the time and this is not the place. I thought of saying that he was the best dad ever, but this is a bit cliche and everyone would protest that their dad is the best ever and we would each be correct. <laughs> I thought about saying that there was only one Jerry Hester, but again, this is true of every person. So what I landed on is this, dad was more than I could have asked for. A few days before dad passed, I could tell that he was frustrated and in pain. I began to search for a song I could play for him that would bring him some relief. I remembered that dad always loved Kim Clement and I began to search YouTube for one of dad's favorites by him. I found the song Mercy Seat and turned up the volume and in a matter of moments, it was if his entire body sighed in relief and he began to weep in the presence of the Lord. I began to weep too. He turned to me looked me right in the eyes and said, the anointing is as fresh now as it's ever been. That moment will forever be one of the deep special moments in life I shared with my dad. I know he said a couple of things after that time before he passed, but in my mind, those were his last words to me. The anointing is as fresh now as it's ever been. I would now like to share this song with you. I pray it blesses you in the same way it blessed my dad and continues to bless me. Love you, dad, always.
Let my hands forget their skill. My tongue be silent, cold, and still. This bounding heart forget to beat. If I forget your mercy seat, I'll not forget your mercy seat. Buddy, sing with me. I'll not forget your mercy seat. I'll not forget your mercy seat. All over the world right now. Sing. I'll not forget your mercy seat. I'll not forget your sacrifice. I'll not forget your sacrifice. Saving grace. Everybody sing it. I'll not forget your saving grace. Just wait a moment, just honor the presence of the Lord that's in the room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. I feel like it'd be wrong just to rush through this moment. His presence is so powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Oh, you're so good.
What a celebration. What a celebration. I'm, I'm honored to be a part, Matt, Megan, let me just say this. I, there's a lot of people I represent that are in Charlotte loving on you guys today. You're so loved. You guys are so loved. I don't know how I got to be on this. I lucked out to be up here at any point. But uh, I was thinking about it when I was sitting over there. I've been to a lot of celebrations of life, and typically there's two things missing, celebration and life. You know, you go to so many of them, there's no celebration and there's no life. And today, as I've listened to person after person get up here and share, you know, there's a lot you can learn about somebody from who they're surrounded by. I didn't have the privilege to really get to know Jerry too well, but just sitting here listening to the people that have spoke, I've just been in awe, just in awe of the testimony of who he was. You know a lot about a person by their friends. You know what I mean? And I sat over there just like, wow. And I've also sat over there saying, I hope I don't have to get up after that person or after that. And it just kept going. I said, I don't want to get up after any of these people. It's just phenomenal what they're sharing. And it says so much about a person when you hear from all the different people that are honoring them. But even more than that, family says so much. And I was thinking about it. I was talking to Megan before the the memorial began. I said, "I, I wish I'd gotten to know him more. And she said, but you know Matt. And uh, she said, you know him if you know Matt. And I was thinking about the scripture where Jesus said, you know, if you've met me, you've met the Father. And as great as it is to have friends that, you know, are wonderful, powerful people, it's even more of a testimony to get to meet the kids. I mean, that's into my life. That's what I want is my kids just to love the Lord. And that song came on at the end. And this sweet little girl just fell on her face in the presence of the Lord. I was like, that's, that's the testimony. That's, that's, that's the beauty of the life that he's created here on earth. What, a, what an amazing story. And I was thinking about the friends, and I was thinking about the family, how well you've honored him today. And, and then I was thinking about in the middle of that last song about how thick the presence of the Lord was. And I thought, Lord, you've shown up here today to honor Jerry. Like, I've never felt that before. Like, you know, it's, we expect family to be here, but we were in that moment and I thought, the Lord is literally here honoring Jerry. There's no greater thing than for the Lord to show up. And I, I, I literally, like, called me crazy. I, I could see almost a haze of the presence of the Lord on this stage at the very end there. And I thought, Lord, you're here to honor Jerry. Wow. I mean, that's great. There's some cool people that show up at funerals, but when Jesus shows up to honor you, (laughs) you've done well. You've done well. Like I said, I I never got to know Jerry real well, but I have gotten to know Matt and just the testimony of your family is beautiful. Martha, you've you've honored him well today. Uh, The first time I met Matt, I, I, I know I'm just supposed to pray, but I'm just saying a couple things. I met him at an eschatology conference you were hosting. Every pastor knows the holy cow of ministry is end times. And this house was, they've been so bold at bringing people into just, just bringing them out of fear and bringing them into truth. And uh, I remember when I pulled up, I didn't even know what I was going to. I just, a friend was there and you were, and that's where I met you. And I could smell the barbecue from the parking lot. <laughs> I thought, they're really going after this. And so you guys have just, what a heritage, you know? What a heritage in your family, in this house, and your friends, everyone that's been here, of just how well you've, you know, I was praying this morning. And I said, Lord, what's your heart for Jerry? And I just kept hearing the same phrase over and over and over. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Like, I know that's traditional to say at a, at a memorial, but genu- genuinely, that's what I heard the Lord saying over him was just, well done, my good and faithful servant. But that also relates to you guys, well done, good and faithful servants. You guys have done well. You've done well. And so I just want to read a scripture, and I'm going to pray out of it, and, and we'll re- we're going to release you all. Philippians 4, verse 4, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Here's the, here's the, here's the verse I wanted to really hit. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that one more time. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. One thing that I think we've all learned is at times you have to choose, do you want peace or do you want understanding? <laughs> and I think I'll take just peace. <laughs> Sometimes I don't need to understand it all. But it says that his peace will surpass understanding. Just usually you have to let go of your right to understand before you get to step into that peace. And so today, as we just let go of the right to understand, sometimes we don't understand everything that's happened, but we know letting go of that, we can step into peace. And so I just want to release the peace of God. His presence is already here, but his peace is what calms the storm. And so today with just all of the you know, there's been so much life, but there's still so many emotions within the family, and I just want to speak peace over that as we end this morning. And so uh, let's stand as we close in prayer just to honor what the Lord's done and honor Apostle Jerry and the whole family. I believe that when Jesus spoke to the storm, he established peace first, and then he said, be still. And so this moment, Father, I call on you that the king of peace would come into this room right now. We establish peace in this room. The word shalom. We establish peace in this room right now. And just as Jesus could sleep through the storm, he woke up, he established peace, and then he said, all right, now be still. Father, I just speak to all of the different emotions that are going on, Lord, and we just say peace, peace. And anywhere that fear tries to enter in, we say be still, be still, because we know you have this family in your hands. So, Father, we thank you for the story and the legacy that lives on from Jerry. We thank you for this family. Lord, I thank you personally just for the ones that I've gotten to know, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the countless thousands of lives that aren't even in this room that have been touched by Apostle Jerry. And Lord, we do celebrate him today. We celebrate you. He is, as it's been said, he truly is not dead. He is more alive now than he has ever been in his entire life. He is not dead. We just don't have the privilege to stand with him right now. But he is here in this great cloud of witnesses, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this day. And we give honor, Lord, to Jerry. But, Lord, we also give honor, Father, to you, the one who truly deserves all honor and praise. We give it to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. Here's what I'm going to do. Before you're dismissed, we first want to allow the family to... Uh, have a moment to leave and so they're going to spend a few minutes privately together and so at this point in time I'm going to uh, give you guys the freedom to step out the immediate family and while they are while they're leaving just a couple announcements for everyone else they have graciously invited everyone to stay after this celebration and they're going to have some refreshments and some food out in the foyer and so they want to spend time just uh, uh, just spending time with you guys also, there's some memory cards that they've placed out there on the tables in the foyer. So if you had the privilege of getting to know Jerry, uh, write down a story and put it in one of those jars out there. They like to collect all of those. And so at this point in time, though, we bless you all, and we're going to just release you into the foyer. <laughs>